look back over my life and I think things over. I can truly say the Lord has made a way. I got a testimony as I look back over my life. Oh, 
testimony, yeah. God's been so good to me. Yes, he has. Yes, I've got him. Oh, yes, I've got him. I've got a testimony. blessings upon the hearers and most certainly the doers of the word of God. The scripture starts off with a preposition. The word for and in some circles, it is grammatically incorrect to start a sentence with a preposition, and yet it is allowed. But in this sense, the word for preceding God connects us to the subject matter that preceded verse 16, but also connects us to the words that are lifted in verse 16. So today, briefly, we would like to focus our attention upon the wording in verse 16, for God so loved. Today there seems to be a lot of discussion and debate on the entity, the existence of God. So much so that man's intelligence has allowed uh, some to feel that uh, God is not really needed in certain circles, that there is a place for God, but not every place needs God. And of course, we know otherwise. But I would like to lift that the word God is not a name, but it is a title. The word God is not a name, but it is a title. It means deity, the supreme being the self-existing one. When it is offered in this passage of scripture, it comes against 
the worship of gods in comparison to God. Now, when this was offered, we have, and we still have it today, the residue of myths and allegories and paganistic gods. But we would like to confirm our belief as to the God that we serve. For there is no other. So I wanted to lift some of the attributes, the characteristics of God. None of these things are a surprise to God. For just as some of us think that we know who we are, God certainly knows who he is. But it is our acknowledgement as he presented himself to us that gave us the names that we associated to him. Once we begin to know the qualities and the characteristics of God, we start off with El, the strong one. El Elyon, the most high God. Elohim, the all powerful, the one creator. El Elam, the eternal God, the everlasting God. El Roy, the God who sees me, the God who sees through me, the God who knows me, the God that I cannot hide from, the God that sees beneath the facade that I project to others, the God that made me. El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. Emmanuel, God with us. And then Yah, Jehovah, the great I am that I am. Not I was or not I will be, but I am that I am. Whatever you need me to be, that's who I am. Whenever you need me to be there, that's who I am. When you don't acknowledge me, I am that I am. When you do acknowledge me, I am that I am. I always have been. I always will be. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Some of us had to wait until he began to provide before we could acknowledge him as the provider. After all he had already done, after all he had already given, until he fulfilled an absence and a void in my life, I didn't really know him personally as a provider. But now I say with no hesitation, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And then some of us in these old clay temples began to recognize him as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. And then as we walked along this journey, we began to recognize him as a shepherd, 
Jehovah Ra. But I want to say this. Some of our foreparents were illiterate and they couldn't read. They didn't know his name was El or El Shaddai. They didn't call him Jehovah Jireh. But they still had a relationship. And God did not withhold his words to them or his provisions to them or his strength or his holiness or his righteousness because they didn't call him by his name. Think of how many of our foreparents are residing in heaven right now and never read the word because we serve a God of spirit. He looks to the heart of man and not just to our literal ability. And then I wanted to lift this as well. I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a male, I'm a man, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a choir member, I'm a minister, I'm a teacher, I'm a carpenter, I'm a construction worker, I'm a neighbor, I'm a friend, but if you just call me Leonard, I'll answer. <laughs> Don't get caught up on the name. Our God is so far above that. Some of us are petty and we are stuck on name recognition. For us, that's vanity. We don't serve a God that has one ounce of vanity. I wanted to lift that. And the scripture says that he so loved the world. It didn't say for God loved the world, but it said that he so loved the world. Now here, following that, we recognize because of his love for the world, it caused him to do something which should impact upon us that love is not just a spoken word. Love is a what word? Love is an action word, which means it should be acted upon more than it is spoken. Because if the action precedes the spoken, I'll recognize the spoken when I hear it because of the action I've already seen. So first of all, because he loved past tense, it didn't say that he so loved, it said he so loved past tense. From the beginning all the way to the end, he saw the end before the beginning, but it didn't hesitate him. It didn't cause him to say, because of how things are going to circulate and how things are going to change, 
Maybe I'll say, because I so liked the world. But no, he saw everything that we were going to do, and he still said that he so loved the world. Some of us go from love to like to hate to maybe so, today, tomorrow, I don't know, depending on how you speak to me, how you treat me. Think of what God had to put up with in us, and he still said, I so love the world that it caused me to give of myself and send it in the form of my son. Now, we want to talk about the world. Since the world has so many problems today, he didn't just look at America, because we always want to say, God bless America. God bless America. But the scripture didn't say he so loved America. But it said that he so loved the world. That includes Asia, Africa, Europe, South America. That includes Australia. That includes the Greenlands. That includes the Caribbean islands. That includes the world. Everybody. He didn't just look and say, you know, I think this gift might be good for Africa, but I don't know if Europe will accept it. It might be good for Australia, but I don't know if Brazil can handle it. It might be good for the Caribbean island, but I don't know if China can get on board. Some of us, when we go out to buy a gift, now they made it easy for us because they say, hey, just get a gift card and just give it to somebody. You know, it takes all of the effort out of it. You don't have to think about the person. You just give them a gift card, and then they look at it and they say, I don't shop uh, at Target. Uh, is this redeemable? Can I take this back? I don't shop at Target, I'm sorry. You know, if I choose to buy a gift for one of my brothers or one of my brothers and sisters here, you know, I have to try and get to know you to figure out what your taste are like, you know, what do I think, you know, how is this gift going to you know, work for them? Is it something that they need? I'm not sure. You know, maybe I got to try to consult somebody. You know so-and-so and so, what do they like? Can you help me out? I'm having a little problem trying to figure out what, you know, what should I get them? But God looked at all of us that he made, and he recognized that the one thing that all of my creatures, all of my children need is the Savior. They all need a Savior. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and some of you all can, we can talk, we can dialogue here. But I want to ask somebody, is there anybody in here that doesn't need deliverance? Is there anybody in here that didn't need a pardon? Is there anybody in here that didn't need redemption? Anybody in here that didn't need forgiveness? Is there anybody in here that didn't need grace? Anybody in here that didn't need mercy? Anybody in here that didn't need love? Anybody in here that didn't need faith, blessings, restoration? He saw all of what we are and recognized they need salvation. They need deliverance. They need direction. They need light. They need life. And he knew that this one gift would be something all of us would have to need. 
None of us could reject it, although plenty do. But that's your own rejection. Man, this part here. That he gave his only begotten son. Having um, two sons of my own, I can't think of someone that I would be willing to send my son to die for. I would willing, maybe, to execute myself. But I don't see anyone that I would be willing to send my son to die for. Being how that I can reflect back on the delivery room and the joy that I felt at the birth of all three of my children. But I still don't know anyone that I would be willing to give either of them to die in their place. But God loved the world so much that he took of himself and enveloped it in human flesh. And the word said, Emmanuel, God with us sent it in the form of a child to dwell among us. And then he said, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now just briefly, I want to talk about the God with us. I just want to just think about what, what does that actually mean? And John 1.14 helps me and it says, and the word was made flesh and it dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And all of the things that we were missing, all of the things that we needed, the things that we were lacking, our shortcomings, our frailties, our inadequacies. He sent it to us in flesh so we could recognize and identify it. But we wanted it to be like us. We wanted it to come in slaying and slaughtering and killing and taking no prisoners. But because it came in a peaceful manner, we weren't ready to receive him. We wanted him to come in to entice our intellect, to pump us up with great philosophies and long theses and lectures. But because he spoke to us in parables, and made it so clear that a child could understand it. 
those among us that were great philosophers and teachers, they couldn't receive it. We wanted him to come and join in with the cultural trend. And we wanted him to take sides with our patriarchal and our masculinity and our dominance on the other member of ourselves. We wanted him to link in with the sexism and the suppression of femininity, but he wouldn't go along with the trend. He stood with the woman. And around the world today, we see very devout religious practitioners who are quick to suppress womanhood, not recognizing that a scripture said male and female created he them. When we suppress one factor of ourselves, we also suppress our maleness. But Christ, he would not side with the chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In every case that we read in scripture, he lifted the woman up And the religions of the world today need to look at Christ anew. Now, I want to close. It said that whosoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life. Why, why, why are we uh, assembled here today? Did we just come to see each other? Did we just come to hear the singing? Did we just come for, this is a part of our routine schedule. It's on the list of things to do. Why do we come to the house of God? For what purpose? For the same purpose that he sent his son into the world to die for us. For salvation. For a word to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be directed, to be instructed. So the word of God in Romans 10 and 14 said, and how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach except they be sent when we come into the house of God we come to hear from our creator we don't come to see what somebody is wearing this is not a fashion show Although, as we look around, we see that we adorn to ourselves some of the finest linen. But this is not a fashion show. We don't come here if we just want to see each other. We have cell phones, we've got Facebook, we've got emails, you know, social clubs we can come and gather at. But we come here for the purpose of what our creator made us for, for us to come together as a body of one, for us to not be able to fall no further than one among us, for us to strengthen each other along this walk, for us to encourage each other, 
for us to reach out and help the members of the body of Christ, for us to lift each other up, not to tear each other down. But we came here because we seek direction and a word from God. And therefore, this place is sacred. Just as he told Moses, take the shoes off of your feet, for the ground that you stand on is holy ground. When we come in his presence, don't bring the mess from the world unto the Lord, because our God is not a God of mess. The mess is what we brought to him. And he said, I'm the corrector of the mess. You came to the right place. So, if we're here because we're trying to strengthen our belief, what we believe in has to be sent out. We believe that God sent his only begotten son into the world that his, his spirit became flesh and it dwelled among us and it was a light in a dark world. It was shining a direction for us because all of us had lost our way and gone in our own different directions. But thanks be unto God, he sent his only son to bring us back to him, to reconcile his family together again. And I am thankful this morning that he sent, that he cared enough for Leonard that he sent his son to the cross to die for us. So as I leave you in the words of peace, I pray God's blessing upon our family. We are in a trying time. Our pastor is ill. The devil is busy. Our pastor is ill. The devil is busy. But that's all right. <laughs> Through the strength of God, the devil don't scare me. Me by myself, I would fear him. But through the strength of God, the devil don't scare me. I turn him over to the Lord. Because the Lord said that he would make him my footstool. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God bless you and God keep you is always my prayer. At this time, we would like to call out to those who don't know Christ in the pardon of their sins and just to say that he died for you too. <laughs>